Hello, everyone. We are glad to welcome Dr. Emma Hart, who is Professor of Pathology at the University of Pennsylvania Fairland School of Medicine. So today, she's going to present a slide seminar and talk on liver pathology, which is titled Learning to Love the Liver Logically. So this is the first part of our two-part talk on liver pathology. As always, you can feel free to post your comments and questions on the Facebook chat window as well as on the YouTube window, and Dr. Fert will answer the questions at the end of the lecture. Thank you, Dr. Fert, for your time, and over to you now, Dr. Fert. All right. So thank you for joining us. And So the goal in all of pathology, but particularly in liver pathology, is to render a diagnosis, because the diagnosis is important in terms of caring for our patients. People are usually very afraid of uh, medical liver biopsies, especially because of the immense uh, work that it takes to extract features, correlate that with the laboratory findings, and clinical presentation. What I want to, for you to come away with today is to understand the approach to the liver from a logical standpoint and how to begin to identify patterns of injury that will lead us to being able to make helpful uh, diagnosis. So therefore, we want to avoid just giving a description. This description is not a diagnosis. So the way that I approach the liver is that I want to first understand its function and the structure of the liver therefore follows from what the main functions of the liver are. By understanding its structure and function and how the liver works, one can perturb each of the components and basically derive the outcomes of these perturbations. The outcomes of perturbations of any system uh, we term, uh, quote, disease, depending upon the severity in terms of affecting our patient. So therefore, I want to approach this session in this logical format. In order to do that, we will review some of the first principles of the structure and function of the liver and emphasize throughout these sessions the aspect of true critical thinking. Again, I will show you how we can derive diagnosis by, by truly a mechanistic understanding. So the emphasis will be on derivation of, uh, of structures and features so that we can develop a critical thinking approach to understand the dysfunction of the liver when it exists and come away with a mechanistic understanding of all of these processes. So as I said, the roadmap for our sessions will be that we will become engineers and by understanding the function of the liver, be able to therefore understand how the liver is put together, its structure. I will show you then how in dealing with liver biopsies in the medical liver situation that we go about extracting various features of the perturbation of the normal liver such that we can synthesize these features and correlate those with the laboratory findings and clinical presentations to derive what we'll call pattern or patterns of injury. Once we derive those pattern or patterns of injury, we can render a diagnosis that will be important in terms of prognosis for the patient and treatment. In general, the way that I approach a medical liver biopsy is that I first observe the liver biopsy without any clinical or laboratory information. I extract a set of features that I see based on histology alone. At that point then, I synthesize the histologic features to uh, discern what I think the pattern or patterns of injury are. I then get the laboratory information and clinical records of the patient and synthesize all of this information together with what my histologic assessment has been. 
I then synthesize each of these separate data frame feature extraction sets to then develop a diagnosis. And of course, all of this reiterative process requires um, discussion with uh, our hepatology colleagues. In dealing with liver biopsies, we have to, our first question when looking at this uh, uh, on the tray is, and under the microscope is, the first question is, is this liver biopsy adequate? We don't want to begin to render diagnosis if the tissue is inadequate for a diagnosis. And while we may think we are being helpful in trying to make diagnosis on very limited tissue, in actuality, we could do great harm because our diagnosis based upon limited tissue could be absolutely inaccurate. inaccurate. So how does one even determine if the liver biopsy is adequate for a diagnosis? Well, this depends up upon the situation. So if one has a biopsy and one has a malignant diagnosis, then perhaps even if it's a limited material, that may be sufficient. If one is dealing with a patient medical liver biopsy who is a transplant patient, post-transplantation, then there are strict criteria for the number of portal tracts that are needed in order to adequately assess for the presence or absence of acute rejection and presence or absence of chronic rejection, respectively. For the usual medical liver biopsy, barring uh, the transplant situation, the de definition of adequacy is somewhat in the eye or the beholder. But for me, I would go with the number of portal tracts, least number of portal tracts needed in terms of uh, making a diagnosis of acute rejection, which a literature state should be uh, greater than or equal to four portal tracts. That being said, I think obviously the more tissue one has, the, the better. The other issue in terms of tissue adequacy is understanding the distinction between a liver biopsy versus a wedged liver resection for uh, medical liver analysis. As we'll go through, subcapsular liver biopsies, wedge biopsies are not very uh, much of a good adequate tissue in assessing fibrosis as the fibrosis under the capsule is much greater than that within the parenchyma proper. Assuming that one has a adequate liver biopsy, the next question uh, that we ask ourselves when looking at it under the scope is, this is a neoplastic process or lesional process, or is this fall under the medical liver biopsy realm? Today, we will be concentrating on the medical liver biopsy. As stated, in order to understand how we can go about diagnosing abnormal, one has to appreciate what normal is. And once one understands normality, I will show how we can perturb each of the components of the liver to derive the subsequent perturbations of the system. And therefore, we'll be able to work backwards, given a perturbation of the system, to work backwards to understand what the possibility of the perturbations are, the ideologies of that liver disease. Hence, we will be able to mechanistically derive what the possible ideologies of the liver damage are given a medical liver biopsy. So let's begin with a case. This will be a 65-year-old woman who undergoes a right hepatectomy for liver mass. I will not show you the liver mass, but we will look at the background liver at this time. So what we are currently seeing here is a, that's not a liver biopsy, but this is because it's from a liver wedge re, a resection for a mass, this is the background liver. So let's take a look at what we are looking at here. So at low power, we can see that 
we do have portal triads, and we'll go on higher power to look at that. And a portal triad is composed, as we understand, by a bile duct, hepatic artery, portal vein. The size of each of these structures in relationship to one another, as well as in relationship to the total size of the portal tract, remains univariant, depend, um, independent upon the size of the portal tract. For example, the size of the artery compared to the bile duct should be relatively comparable to each other. And even when I go to a smaller portal tract here, we can see that the caliber of this hepatic artery is the same as its corresponding bile duct. So we can judge the presence of each of these structures in the triad, the artery, the bile duct, and the portal vein. So being present is important. But the next question then is, are these structures normal? We judge their structures if, there's, if they're normal by their relationship to the size compared to the total portal triad, as well compared to their pairing. So for example, again, the fact that this hepatic artery and this bile duct are of the same caliber shows that they are normal. So I judge the presence and absence in, of the bile duct by looking for its paired artery and judging its normality by comparing its size to its normal corresponding artery. Considering the portal vein, what we, we should understand that it should be basically one continuous um, lumen and its size in relationship to the total portal triad is about 75%. So yes, it's present, but understanding its shape and its volume compared to the total portal tract is important. And as I said, the relationships in those structures are independent of the size of the portal tract. Now in this liver biopsy wedge, we can then go to the, I next go to the terminal venule, which is shown here. And the size of the terminal venule is going to dictate whether we have a continuous endothelial lining versus a discontinuous endothelial lining. The larger the terminal venule, the more probable of having a continuous endothelial lining. The hepatic cords are displayed here. Now, in this situation, they're not your typical textbook hepatic cords for the following reason, and I'll get to that. But right here, we can see an hepatic cord, and this space here, the hepatic sinusoid, is where the blood travels. Here we have an endothelial cell. And in an adult, this hepatic cord should be about one cell thickness. Now, over here, this is not normal. What we have here in this situation is that we have spaces in the hepatocyte. This is steatosis. And when one has a steatotic or fatty liver, one can start to lose the normal uh, architecture in terms of defining the hepatic cords. That being said, this does not negate that these are actually true hepatic cords, one cell layer thick. The other thing to keep in mind is that this pigment here in the hepatocyte. This is lipofuxin. It should not be confused with some other um, pigment such as hemosiderin. And this is normal for age and it can be seen especially with fatty liver. Now, why do I say it's not hemosiderin even without a stain? Well, if it were hemosiderin, because the blood flow goes through the portal tracts and then exits through the terminal venule, if it were hemosiderin, the deposition of hemosiderin iron in the liver is dependent on blood flow gradient, one should then expect to see that pigment within the hepatocytes that have first chance of seeing the blood, which would be closer to the portal tract. The fact that that pigment that I showed you is further away, i.e. in zone three, is in keeping with the fact that it's lipofuxin. Let's move on to look at some of these special stains that we can have in the liver. And one of these 
right now to show you is the reticulin stain. And this is the reticulin stain. The reticulin stain is important because it helps show the paddock architecture. It stains on some of the um, proteins, some of the collagen types that are present in the space of this, and that's why we have these black lines. So it stains type 3 collagen, whereas trichrome stain that we'll show shows stains type 1 collagen. Now, you could say, why do we even have staining within the space of this with the reticulin? You're telling me that it's staining collagen. It doesn't make sense given the function of the liver. Well, the space of this, as I'll show you, is truly a space. And the, the type 1 collagen and other proteins, such as laminins, that are present within the space of this do not form any ultrastructural structure. So therefore, the free exchange of blood from the sinusoids with the hepatocytes through the fenestrated epithelium is free flowing. An important part of the reticulin stain and highlighting architecture, and one of the pitfalls that I'm showing you here, is that especially in the steatotic liver, you'll note that there's loss of the reticulin framework in the area of the steatotic liver. Why is this important? This is important for a diagnostic reason in that reticulin stain is often used in assessing possible neoplastic liver biopsies for the possibility of hepatocellular carcinoma, where we may use a reticulin stain to help highlight a macrotrabecular architecture. What's important to understand here in the pitfall of the steatotic liver is that one could say going from this black line from the reticulin stain and counting the number of cells till we hit another reticulin staining space here, one crosses more than four cells. And if that is your criteria for macrotrabecular architecture, in this situation, it would be met. However, this is absolutely not hepatocellular carcinoma. And therefore, again, appreciating the fact that the reticulin framework in the setting of fatty liver disease may be somewhat lost is an important feature to understand so that one does not fall into the pitfall of assuming that this is hepatocellular carcinoma. In turning to the trichrome stain, trichrome stain stains type 1 collagen. Type 1 collagen is really a very structural, hard collagen. And as such, it makes sense that we should have some blue in the portal tracts for its structure. Now, I show you here, there is some blue in this even the smaller portal structure, and that's normal. What should never be normal, what is not normal, because type 1 collagen forms basically a barrier, as you'll note, the lack of blue within the sinusoids, even in this steatotic part of this liver. And that makes sense because you want to have free-flowing exchange of the blood through the sinusoids with the hepatocytes through the fenestrated endothelium. So this is an example of a normal trichrome stain. So what I've showed you here is that this has a fatty liver, but I've gone through with you some of the uh, stains that highlight some of the normal architecture of the liver. And it serves their function in terms of the liver being a synthetic organ and as well as a clearing or detoxifying organ. And therefore, the maintenance of the free exchange with the blood to the sinusoids is absolutely important. So to summarize case one, I've showed you how to approach the liver from a low power standpoint. For each case, we identify the structures. And I like to start with the portal tracks and to identify each component and ask, are they there? Are they normal? I identify the terminal venules and ask the same questions. I then turn to the paddock cords and look at each of those compartments and utilize my special stains as well to highlight their normality or abnormality. 
So here is how I look at the liver in terms of reducing it to its key components. And I'll be coming back to this diagram to show how we'll perturb each of these components and derive the injury pattern. So we have the portal triad, and I show you the relationship of each of the components uh, to each other and the total surface area of the portal tract. We have the paddock cords with the fenestrated endothelium, and we have the terminal venules. So this is how I view the liver, and the liver is just simply a compilation of this, of this structure that I showed you here. So again, here we have the normal portal triad and the relationship of the size of each of the constituencies to each other is important in terms of assessing normality. Artery and duct are the same size, portal vein about 75% of the whole surface area. And what's also important is to understand that each of these structures must be within the confines of the portal tract, meaning that if we were to draw a circle around the portal triad here, its matrix, each of these structures must be within the confines of that triad. If we have something that looks like a bile duct that's outside that, as we'll see in subsequent cases, that is not normal. And that would be an example of a bile duct roll, which should not be confused with a normal bile duct. We then have the hepatic cords, which empty in the terminal venule. And we have the hepatic uh, cords with the sinusoids in the fenestrated endothelium. And I show you my cartoon rendition in terms of their constituencies with relationship to what we just saw in terms of the reticulin stain uh, that we showed in terms of the nice hepatic cords. Another important normal feature of the liver is the blood flow. We know that it goes through the hepatic artery and the portal vein. There are capillaries which feed the bile duct. And so the bile duct is dependent upon flow from the hepatic arterial only, whereas the parenchyma has a dual blood supply of arterial and venous blood. The trichrome stain I showed you stains normally in the portal tracts. And depending upon the size of the terminal central vein, one may have some collagen staining with the trichrome, and that's normal. What's not normal, and I show you here, is normal is to have any trichrome staining within the space of this. And that makes sense, again, given the function of the liver. So trichrome stains type 1 collagen, and reticulin stains type 3 and type 1, but it's the type 3 that is present within the space of this. And its role in the space of this uh, is many. One of its roles is that it's important in terms of the signaling to the hepatocyte to help maintain its uh, polarity. The second is that the, re that the reticulin fibers and other fibers, uh, molecules within the space of this, serve to basically Velcro or zipper the endothelial cells to the space of this maintaining its architecture. We'll now go and we'll start to perturb each of these components and see what will happen. I'd like to talk about patterns of injury. And one may have one of these patterns of injury, or sometimes we have mixtures of various. So either you have no injury pattern, you can have cholestatic, hepatitic, mixtures, an infiltrative or a vascular type of injury. And I'll show you how we'll derive this from both the histology as well as the liver-associated enzyme profile. Again, we will use our compartmental analysis. So now we'll do a case, case two. This is a 62-year-old woman who underwent a liver transplant for cirrhosis secondary to hepatitis C. 20 to 5 days later, she becomes jaundiced. Her liver-associated enzymes were elevated. We'll discuss those in details in a later talk. She was relisted and taken back to the operating room. And what we'll see right now is her explanted liver.
Okay. Here we have this section of her explanted liver. So at uh, So at low power, you can see that there seems to be a zonal process occurring here. So let's, let's go through and do exactly as we did uh, before. So here, this is a large portal triad. We have a bile duct, the, the um, paddock artery here, another bile duct, a paddock artery. You can see that they're same, they are paired at the same size. And here we have a vein. Here we have a huge paddock artery here. Um, so those structures are present and they appear to be normal. Now let's go to the terminal venular area or zone. And here it's hard to even determine that it was a terminal venule, but buried in here is a collapsed terminal venule. We can see that there appears to be a somewhat of a zonal process happening here where the hepatocytes are becoming small, and they have a lot of brown pigment. Not only do they have a lot of brown pigment, we can see that the pigment is in a particular structure here, which is the bile canaliculus. This brown pigment is cholestatic debris, and so we have canalicular cholestasis here, which is present here and also present within hepatocytes. Let's see. The rest of the paddocords here, we can note here that the paddocytes here are actually, uh, they're, they're normal. They may be a little bit swollen, but, but they're relatively normal compared to the cholestatic injury that we have in further in zone three. Not only is there cholestatic injury, we can see that some of these hepatocytes are starting to die, and for example, right here. We can see that the nuclei is starting to condense and the cytoplasm is condensing as well. And this is a process that is occurring diffusely throughout the liver. We can see almost this triangular shape of this cholestatic process here going from the portal tract and creating this triangle. And this triangle is, imp is important because I'll show you that this triangle nicely highlights zone three. So zone three, we talk about the zones of the liver, one being closest to blood flow, two being in between, and three being the area of the liver that sees the blood flow last. Zone three is not simply a, a circle around the terminal venule. It's actually triangular shape. In this case, nicely illustrates the triangular shape of zone three. Now, getting back to extracting the features and understanding what the process is, is giving to this cholestatic injury coupled with some death of the hepatocytes in zone three, how can we figure this out? Well, we've gone through our portal triads and let's just do this again, because what I wanna show you here in this portal triad is that look at this bile duct. This bile duct, yes, it's present, but if we look at each of these cells, we can see that the spacing of those nuclei in this bile duct are unequally spaced. They're unequally spaced, and if you look at the shape of the nuclei of this bile duct, they're abnormally shaped as well. This is an indication that this bile duct is not normal. It is injured. So with the features that we have so far is that we have injury of the bile duct proper, and we have a zone three cholestatic hepatitic injury pattern. So how can we go about putting this together in terms of our clinical presentation and understanding what might be happening with this patient? Before we do that, let's take a look at the trichrome stain in this patient's liver as well. And the purpose of looking at the trichrome stain, what helps me with this, is to establish whether this is an acute injury pattern versus a chronic injury pattern. With chronic injury patterns to the liver, one has a fibrotic 
response that ensues. When I look at this trichrome here, you could say, well, gee, yes, there are maybe little blue wisps throughout here. But be very careful in interpreting the trichrome stain in areas of necrotic liver. It can give you a false positive. So I would say that within this liver that there is really not much in the way of a fibrogenetic response at all. So the point of the trichrome in this situation, one of the pitfalls is not to overinterpret the trichrome stain in areas of necrosis. So what we've now seen is that this patient has an acute, probably an acute liver injury that is featured by bile duct injury and zone three cholestasis with, this, with hepatic injury. This is an example in this situation of an ischemic type injury pattern. And what has happened is that the, in this situation, this patient's hepatic arterial underwent an acute thrombosis leading to zone three ischemic injury of the hepatocytes. Now you could say, but you've shown me first that there's been an incredible cholestatic injury pattern. How can that happen? Well, remember that the bile duct is fed solely by a branch of the hepatic arterial system. So let's go through the blood flow so that we can figure out each of the components of the blood flow through the liver and how they may affect each of the structures. So the blood flow through the liver is two components, one, the portal venous, and second, the hepatic arterial. It goes through the, the liver and then exits through the hepatic veins. So it goes in, vein, arterial, goes through the liver and exits through the veins, and that's all it is. The zones to which I refer simply reflect to where they are with the gradient of blood flow. And people think of these as just basically circles around the terminal venule, but that's not true. So let's see how it works and establish that triangle I just shared with you. So the blood flow goes through the portal triads and goes through the parenchyma and exits to the terminal venule. But if you look at the gradient of nutrients and oxygen as it goes through there, the topology is like this. There's, and I show you these triangles to represent the gradient and with decrements of oxygen and nutrients as it goes through. If you keep building that up through each of those portal triads, this is what the zones look like. Zone one, first dibs of those oxygen and nutrients. Zone two, second dibs. And zone three, we just call last dibs. And it will give you the triangular shape that I shared with you, which represents zone three. I want to show you one more example of zone three injury, and I will get back to why this patient presented with a primarily a cholestatic injury pattern that may be seemingly different from the usual ischemic injury patterns that you may associate with the liver. Here is another example that highlights the zonal pattern of the liver. In this case, in this injury pattern, the injury affected zone three predominantly and spilled into zone two. And the nice pink, dark pink that you're seeing here, hugging the portal tracks, is actually now showing you remnant viable hepatocytes in zone one. And again, to show you that the zones are not simply spheres around um, a structure. So here we have a zone three predominant injury pattern. What can cause that? Well, certainly ischemia is one. And let's take a look further. Here we can see in this portal triad, unlike our case, the bile duct is perfectly healthy. Here's its paired hepatic artery. You can see they're basically twins. We come out here to the hepatocytes right next to the portal triad, the limini plate. And while these hepatocytes are not particularly normal, they're not, they're not dead. We then see that there's a sharp interface of viable hepatocytes with hepatocytes that are certainly not viable. 
and what can do that? Well, ischemia is certainly one of them. But if we look closer at the hepatocytes in this particular case, we can see that the that their nuclei is still intact. And if you look at the cytoplasm, it has a very red granular look. If this were ischemia, ischemia should cause in terms of hepatocytes, it may cause a coagulative type necrosis. Or as we sh showed in our first case, it could cause an ischemic type injury because of the injury to the bile duct based upon hepatic arteria flow to the duct. So pure abrupt ischemia that causes liver parenchymal infarction will be manifested histologically by coagulative necrosis. We can see in this situation that the hepatocytes do not fulfill that criteria for coagulative necrosis. Therefore, I can um, conclude that this is absolutely not an ischemic pattern of injury. And in this situation, as I've shown you here, this is a classic histologic manifestation of a sentimentified um, overdose in, um, injury. Now, why is it in zone three? Well, that is because the toxic metabolite from this particular medication is generated in zone three through the P450 system. So zone three injuries may vary in terms of their ideology, and it's important to key in on the histologic features of the injury process. Getting back to our first case where we presented with a primarily cholestatic pattern of injury and a bile duct injury, this is because with, especially in the liver transplant population where their hepatic arterial branches are very tenuous with her hepatic arterial thrombosis, because the bile duct is dependent solely upon branches of the hepatic arterial, it can undergo injury and outright infarction at time. And I show you a case here where the bile duct post-transplantation through hepatic arterial thrombosis underwent complete infarction. You'll note that the surrounding parenchyma has a nutmeg look, not because of outflow injury, but because of ischemic injury to, to the hepatocytes. Here's a larger example of what an hepatic arterial thrombosis tr post-transplantation may look like, leading to bile duct infarction and so-called conical bilomas just represent the spill of the um, bile through those necrotic bile ducts. Other things can cause ischemia, particularly, uh, and it will primarily affect the bile ducts. And what I show you in this picture is, the, is an effect infarcted bile duct with its biliary contents and right next door lodged in the hepatic artery are these bees that were used to uh, chemoembolize a neighboring tumor. So let's move on to case three and case three is a 23 year old woman who presents with anemia. She was found to have esophageal varices and portal hypertension. Imaging showed several liver masses up to three centimeters. We will not be dealing with the masses in this section. Now let's turn to her liver biopsy. And let's go through the same things we've done before. So now we're getting a little bit more advanced here, and now we're dealing with liver biopsies. Just looking at this, you might get scared because it seems like there's all these fragments all over the place and where you begin. Well, I simply begin at one end and go across and examine each and every piece of tissue, and I ask the same questions each and every time. I first find, here's a portal tract. Yes, I can find a portal tract. Are the structures present? Here's a bile duct. Here's its hepatic arterial branch. They are the same size. That's great. This is the total size of the portal triad. Here's the hepatic vein. And right off the bat, even though this is rather small and you could argue that part of it is cut off, 
right off the bat, even with this one portal track, I would argue that the Portal Venus branch is not of the correct size for this entire surface area of the portal track. It's too small. That's just an N of 1. Let's continue through, and you'll note that I'm not stopping at each you know, field along the way. Um, what I actually do is I try and I look at all of the portal tracks first, and then I go back and I, and I dissect out each of the structures. Uh, let's look at this portal track here. This is a portal track. Don't be fooled by this. This is a portal track right here. So let's first find the structures. Here's a bile duct. There's a bile duct. Here's a bile duct. Here's this corresponding artery. So the structures are here. And vis-a-vis -vis the size of the portal triad, the bile duct and hepatic arterial branch are fine. We do have many of those in this one portal track. So there seems to be a proliferation of those structures. But now let's find the portal vein. Here's a portal vein branch. Here's a portal vein branch. Here's a portal vein branch. So the observation are that there are many independent portal venous branches within the portal triad. That's not normal, number one. Number two, looking at the surface area of this portal triad, the size of these portal venous branches are too small. So now again, we have small portal venous branches, and there are seem to be divided up into little, little spaces. And this is the theme throughout this patient's liver. The portal, the observation is this, that the portal triad seem to have a problem with the portal venous branch. Now let's go to the hepatocytes. The hepatocytes are fine. You can have bi and trinucleation. That, that doesn't mean that there's something horrible. That can be a sign of regeneration, and, and that's OK. The sinusoids here, as we go through them, seem to have a little bit of, of busyness to them. And we'll look on special stains. There could be some Kupfer cell hyperplasia, activation of macrophages. So there is a bit of cellularity to the sinusoids that one does have to take a significant time and un make sure one understands which each of these cells are. Because if you don't do that and make sure that you understand what every cell is in your sinusoid, you may miss subtle things such as a, a hemopoietic disorder that is infiltrating the liver. So I take a great deal of time and going through and doing that for each and every piece. So now let's now let's take a look at some of the special stains in, in this case. And I want to show you now the reticulin stain in this case. So now let's take a look at the reticulum. And remember, the reticulum stains within the space of this and helps to highlight the size of the patacellular cords. So at first glance, it just looks like, how do I, how do I even extract any features from this? What am I trying to do? Well. Let's take a look at this piece right here. This is a portal triad. This is a portal triad. This is a portal triad. And we can go back on the H&E and &E confirm that. But I hope to convince you here that indeed, this is a portal triad. This is a bile duct. This is a, a probably another bile duct, maybe a pedic artery. There is, there's no vein here. It's a little venous branch maybe here. And the point in this situation, even in considering these portal triads, is the following. It's not only important to identify the portal triads and their constituencies, but another important data set is understanding what the relationship is among the portal triads. And given the size of these portal triads, you can see how close they are with relationship to each other. This is too close to that. This is too close to that for this size portal track. So the portal tracks right off the bat are too close together. 
that would imply that there has been a loss of hepatic parenchyma between each of these portal tracts. But you'll note the loss of, if we hypothesize that, the loss of that parenchyma is not on the basis of outright necrosis because the hepatocytes we went through look fine. There's no areas of necrosis. So we hypothesize that there's been a loss of parenchyma between those portal triads. Now let's look over here. At low power, this appears to be somewhat nodular from the reticulum stain. And why is that? Well, you could say, oh my gosh, maybe this person has cirrhosis. Well, cirrhosis is a disruption of hepatocellular architecture by fibrosis with associated regenerative nodules. We have not yet established that there's been fibrosis because recall that the reticulin stain does stain type 1 and type 3 collagen, but the trichrome stain stains the type 1 collagen that would be indicative of the increased fibrosis that we associate with cirrhosis. So having an increased density of reticulin stain in and of itself does not equate to having increased type 1 collagen as shown by trichrome. What this does show, however, in getting back to the vague nodularity, is that if we look at the size of the hepatocytes here, the size or width of the hepatocellular cords here compared to here, if we can see that there is a change in size of the hepatocellular cords because of a change in size of the hepatocytes. So the hepatocytes in this area here, where there's a increased density of the reticulum fibers, the hepatocytes are small. The hepatocytes over here are relatively larger, not because they have been enlarged, but because they tried to maintain their more normal size compared to the shrinking, literally, of these hepatocytes. Now, so we have a change in the size of the hepatocyte with a corresponding almost collapse of the reticulum framework to make up for the loss of the size of the hepatocytes. Here's a portal triad. So not only do we have that feature, but that change in size of the hepatocyte seems to be regular in the sense that it occurs to be mostly in zone three, the small hepatocytes with the more normal size of the hepatocytes and then size of the cords in zone one. And so that gives, that repetitive nature gives this slightly nodular appearance to the liver. So let's see what the trichrome looks like because we need to establish whether or not there's been any fibrosis to account for that nodular architecture. So here now is our trichrome stain. And let's go right back to that area where we concentrated on with the reticulum stain. Here are our portal triads again. And again, note how close they are to each other, implying that there's been a loss of parenchyma. Note the lack of fibrosis that's emanating from these portal triads. Note the lack of fibrosis in the parenchyma. The fibrosis that we see here, or the blue that we see here, is just highlighting the smaller portal triads. So in this particular patient, there's absolutely no increase in fibrosis. So now let's put this all together to establish what has happened with this particular person. So what we've shown here is how to go through each of the compartments of the liver and establish their normality or not. I illustrated here the importance of looking at the spacing among the portal tracts as well. So to summarize, getting back to our original diagram, this case, we the features that we have is we have the normal liver. And now what we see is that and if we concentrate in the portal triad, that the duct and the artery are fine. The size of the portal tract surface area is fine, but the vein has been diminished in terms of its size. We also shown that the hepatocytes in zone three are small compared to the hepatocytes in zone one. And this follows because if you have 
in this case, an injury pattern, the target of injury in this particular case is at the site of the portal venous branch. And if you injure that portal venous branch, and you can injure it in many ways, one, you could have uh, a thromboembolic phenomena in the portal venous system. The second is that sometimes it happens that we don't understand. The, another way it happens is sometimes with umbil umbilical vein sampling in utero, that can incite a thromboembolic phenomena in the portal venous system. Be that as it may, it's injured, and as a result of that injury, its size is diminished. And because the hepatocytes depend on their nutrition, and certainly from the hepatic arteria, but they are very dependent as well from the portal venous blood, the hepatocytes in zone three who get last dibs on that flow become small because they are becoming nutritionally deprived. This is vastly different than the ischemic injury pattern with which we started. So this case is one that's called portal tract phenopathy, and it results because of an injury to the portal venous branch within the liver. Now, why did this patient present with portal hypertension? Well, it makes sense because the blood from the portal vein is going into the liver, and now you have increased the resistance by changing the size or caliber of the portal vein, and since pressure equals flow times resistance, the flow maintains the same, where therefore, with increased this resistance, the pressure goes up. So let's uh, now go to our last case, case four, and this is a 34-year-old woman, woman with normal transaminases, an ALK faucet is slightly elevated, and a normal bilirubin. So let's take a look at our case here. Get that up for you in a moment. And, and. I'm just going to start off right with the trichrome stain in this case. Okay. So let's take a look at the trichrome. Just start with the trichrome in this case. And I can do all of liver pathology just with the trichrome. But here's our portal triad. And I will tell you that all the structures are here. And you'll note that there might be a little bit of increased collagen going out right here. But the main star of the show here is in the terminal venule area here. This is a terminal venule. And you can see that for this size, there is too much collagen in the terminal venular area. Secondly, you can see that that collagen now, type 1 collagen, is ramifying in the space of discs all throughout here. And associated with that is slight dilatation of the sinusoids in this area. So let's continue to see if that's the case. And we can see here, portal triad here. And here is a zone 3 or terminal venular area. And again, the sinusoids are dilated. And there is collagen deposition all along those dilated areas. And you can see how now they are starting to go towards the portal vein, the portal triad. This central to portal fibrotic process is starting from here and going there, central to portal fibrotic process. And this represents this fibrotic process emanating along zone three. So the observations that we have here are that the hepatocytes are relatively normal in the terms of they don't seem to be the exact target of injury. But we have fibrosis in zone 3. And as with the case that we just left, the hepatocytes in zone 3 are smaller than those in zones 1 and 2. So we have small hepatocytes. But unlike the last case, we have increased collagen 
in zone three. So how can we put that together in understanding what the mechanism of the injury is, is here? So let's summarize the findings in this case four. We have started with our normal diagram here. And the observation is that we have collagen in the terminal venule area eking out into the space of this. In some of the portal triads I showed you that we, in addition to that collagen and the small hepatocytes now in zone three with this collagen, we have bile ductular proliferation. So the target of injury in this case is one of the, the venous system. And this is an example of venous outflow pattern of injury. And this can happen in patients with heart failure or other causes of venous outflow, such as thrombosis of the hepatic veins or even on the microanatomy level. But the fundamental concept being that increased pressure within this uh, terminal venular area here signals along the pressure gradient to incite a fibrogenetic response. And that explains the pattern of fibrosis. Secondly, because of that pressure, the hepatocytes in, in that area of increased pressure, because of that pressure, atrophy, and they get smaller in size. So the difference between this case and our other case is that this is due to pressure here, whereas our other case of portal tract venopathy is due to decrement of portal inflow blood, leading to atrophy of the hepatocytes, but no fibrosis. Pressure exuding from this area going into the liver, A, incites fibrosis along that pressure gradient, and B, causes atrophy of the hepatocytes. Now, why was there why did this patient have a slightly elevated alkaline phosphatase, which represents biliary injury? And why was there bile ductual proliferation? Well, let's think about that. With the pressure in this area here in zone three or pressure to the hepatocytes, one is literally squeezing that bile canaliculus. And therefore, one is by pressure alone causing a microanatomy biliary obstructive type of process but not to the point uh, in this case where it causes outright jaundice. However, because of that pressure and injuring in the biocanaliculus and signaling, it signals back to the portal triad for those bile ducts to say, oh gosh, the biocanaliculus is having problems, let's make more bile ducts. Secondly, what also may occur with venous outflow obstruction going along with the pressure gradient feeding back to the portal triad is that over time, the portal vein itself may undergo diminution in its size secondary to, the, to that pressure. So don't be fooled in cases of venous outflow obstruction and concentrating so much on the portal triads that you think that there is a biliary obstructive pattern of injury and forget about the terminal venule in that fibrotic pattern of injury. So here again is an example to highlight the pattern of fibrosis and the atrophy of the reticulin fibers and outflow. And we call this you know, venous outflow pattern of injury. People may ask, what staging scheme or how do I describe the fibrosis in patients with a venous outflow pattern? Well, what I will tell you is I give a descriptive diagnosis. I do not shove it into any staging scheme because it's not appropriate. And I certainly don't use numbers in, in describing it as well. So a descriptive diagnosis in this case is the most appropriate. So let's review the take home points. I've shown you a compartmental approach to the liver to understand its structure and function. I've showed you four cases that highlight how we can perturb the uh, vascular compartments and the different types of injuries and fibrotic responses that occur. Uh, I've shown you by concentrating on a compartmental analysis, you can derive features. Here are three examples of a liver biopsy. The finding in this first liver biopsy is there's no bile duct. That's an important feature. The finding in this second liver biopsy is there's a portal vein that's a problem. The second 
finding in this third liver bias is that there's some zone three damage or factor. So this just highlights the compartmental approach. Fibrotic patterns that I've shown you illustrated in the alpha obstruction from the second biopsy, I've shown you central reporting, portal bridging fibrosis, and subsequent conversations will discuss the, the first and third pattern of fibrotic uh, pattern of injury as well. So Thank that's you, Dr. for the in depth discussion and the case based uh, discussion on different patterns of liver injury. So, we extend our sincere thanks to all our viewers from so many different time zones, including Vietnam, Bangladesh, India, Costa Rica, Brazil, Morocco, among other countries. So we at PatCast appreciate your continued support in our effort to spread pathology education across the world. Please stay tuned for Dr. Fart's second part lecture on liver pathology, which is coming up on May 17 at 8 a.m. Eastern time. You are all most welcome to visit and like our Facebook page, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and also feel free to subscribe to our newsletter so that you can stay updated about the upcoming lectures. And don't forget to visit our website, www.pathologycast.com for all the archived lectures. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Dr. Ferdinand.